thank you so much. Um, I, I really appreciate what it takes to put on a virtual conference, especially when you weren't planning on going virtual. So um, I would like to, you know, extend a thank you to all the organizers uh, because it's a lot of work. First planning a, a in-person con and then transitioning uh, to a virtual only con, but obviously it's for the better of the community. So it's something that had to happen. So thanks again. Uh, my name is Adam Shaw, and today I'm going to be talking about climbing AppSec mountains. A uh, little quick, who am I slide. Um, I work for Contrast Security. I'm a principal application security researcher. Uh, there's my uh, Twitter handle and website if you wanted to follow along with my work or follow up with questions after the talk. Um, of course, uh, like our um, like our intro said, uh, um, if you have questions during the talk, feel free to put them in Discord. Um, I'll go ahead and follow up and I'll be in the breakout room after the talk. So uh, some of my hobbies include spending time with my family, my two kids. Um, they're told not to come in here, but who knows, uh, we might have um, a visitor or two uh, as it is with virtual conferences. Uh, I enjoy home lab, home automation. I'm a Colonel Con board member, which is a conference in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, we also had to go completely virtual this year. So like I said, I feel the pain of the organizers. Um, and I, I enjoy participating in CTF competitions. Uh, quick little inspiration about this talk. Um, uh, in the past, I've worked for some huge companies, um, big Berkshire Hathaway conglomerate, uh, worldwide data provider, cable services conglomerate. All of these companies had um, a huge staff spread, across, spread across, uh, spread across the nation, sometimes the world. And um, I worked at these places and I uh, just got a feel for that large corporate lifestyle and uh, did some application security. I worked on some internal application security teams, some internal software teams. Uh, but now I work for um, in a startup essentially. There was about 150 employees when I started. Uh, we have about 300 employees right now, but um, it's just a world of difference. And so it's really, I was able to reflect back on my time at a big company, and I was able to um, kind of uh, come up with some, some uh, resources and some tips and tricks uh, when you work at a big company like that and uh, and develop this uh, develop this talk so uh, now you might be wondering why a kid from Nebraska is going to talk to you about climbing mountains but just wait it's going to make sense so uh, first I'd like to introduce you to AppSec Ned um, AppSec Ned is just a he's a application engineer. He's a representative of many internal application uh, security engineers into one easy to draw uh, person. Uh, he works for a large enterprise and he's starting an internal application security team at, um, at this large enterprise. And he's happy that his company is prioritizing application security. And like all good security personnel, AppSecNet is on Twitter, so if you're interested in following along um, with his journey, uh, he, he likes to make his way around the nation, talking about the perils of uh, creating mountains for your internal application security teams. So, uh, but he had, so when, when he joined the team, he was given some directives, uh, and th this is kind of generic directives given to all internal application security teams. Uh, first, he had to ensure that all code bases are secure, uh, including all open source software utilized. Um, he had to ensure all future development is secure. Uh, and his board heard the term shift left with future development, so they, they, they made that a priority, uh, which is also um, a kind of a buzzword. We'll, we'll talk more about that later if you haven't heard of it, but uh, if you're in application security, I'm sure you have. Uh, he has to train software developers in secure coding practices and minimize attack vectors in external facing applications. So Ned, Ned has these directives given to him, and uh, but Ned has some industry challenges, right? Uh, two out of every three applications fail to pass initial tests 
on the OWASP top 10 in the SANS 25 standards. That's incredible. 67% or more applications will fail on the initial tests. Um, the average time to remediate an application vulnerability is 171 days. Now, that's the average. There's, of course, outliers, but that seems like a really long time. That's over five months. And uh, one software security specialist to every 73 software engineers and developers. So this is a number pulled from the BSIM. Um, if you sit behind one, maybe even two developers, and you watch them code all day to determine whether or not they're coding securely, you could do that technically. But can you imagine trying to sit behind 73 developers to watch them code? I mean, that's impossible. Not to mention Ned's team also has to review new library vulnerabilities and open source software vulnerabilities that are released every day. These are some serious challenges. Also, um, all of the most common vulnerabilities over the last five years are still just as prevalent today. Uh, these five vulnerabilities were the most common vulnerabilities in 2015, and they're the most common vulnerabilities in 2020. What does that mean? Well, that means that our software teams aren't necessarily learning, right? These are typical mistakes that are still made today. And if you have people who aren't learning or gleaning information from training, that's a problem, right? We would expect that these would fade away and uh, there'd be a new set of the next five top vulnerabilities. That hasn't happened. In addition to these type of challenges, um, also the typical application uh, has a ton of challenges. So in a typical application, this is a this is maybe a little convoluted slide. Let me uh, let me describe it here. In a typical application, 21% uh, is custom code, and about 70 70% 70 is like is unused library code across 30 or more libraries. That's the kind of code that um, gets pulled in with a library and really just isn't utilized. Um, so there's a big discrepancy between the custom code and the library code just in sheer volume. And I, like you can see from the slide deck, uh, the majority of the code is in the unused library code. Well, also, um, over 70% of the code you ship is unused and only two vulnerabilities occur in there on average. Meanwhile, 26 vulnerabilities um, on average occur in the custom code. So that is just adding more numbers to the mix here, but that's 93% of all vulnerabilities that are found occur within the custom code. So this custom code right here, this top of the iceberg, that's where you're going to get 93% of your vulnerabilities. So this is a, another problem that Ned's facing. But Ned really, he knew about all those challenges when he took the job. Um, he had some climbing gear. So Ned had uh, Ned had some climbing gear um, that he knew about going into this job. Uh, the workplace already had static application security testing, or SAST as it's known. They had uh, dynamic application security testing, or DAST. They also had a web application firewall, and they had a compliance team. Um, into your network. Uh, then there's the compliance team for auditing and penetration, remediation, etc. So Ned, he felt prepared for anything. You know, I, I, I prepared this slide before COVID, but then uh, during the toilet paper shortage of 2020 that we'll tell our grandkids about, uh, I thought this was a perfect slide. Um, Oh, I'm being told that there's an audio glitch. Can people still hear me? Okay. Okay. Well, uh, just 
to sum up again, Ned had some uh, hand-me-down climbing gear that the uh, that the um, uh, company he's working for already had uh, SAST and DAST tools, web application firewall, and a compliance team uh, for auditing, penetration, remediation, et cetera. So Ned felt like he was prepared for anything. Um, and uh, so he felt good, but, you know, let's talk a little bit about the state of application security, especially at a large corporation. Uh, there's a lot of hidden challenges. I'm going to go back to the iceberg type slide here, um, where Ned is aware of the top of this iceberg, basically. He's aware of some of the challenges, but there's a lot of hidden challenges associated with working at a big company, um, including old tooling, uh, mergers and acquisitions, new products and new technologies, workplace shifts, and inflexible developers. So th these kind of challenges exist. Um, they're much more prevalent when you're working at a bigger company. And I'm gonna discuss each of these and how AppSecNed can um, overcome challenges like this. So let's talk a little bit about old tools. This is a uh, trigger warning for some people, but um, here's here's some, Here's a uh, application security timeline. And there's uh, there's more uh, to the right here, and there's even more to the left, but I wanna focus on this time period real quick. Um, basically, uh, penetration testing uh, became popularized in 1999. Uh, the OWASP, OWASP top 10 was formalized and introduced in 2001. Uh, but what, what else do we notice here? Um, the four the four uh things that we just talked about as um as his climbing gear they're uh they're old they're more than 17 years old this is when they were introduced that's not to say that uh ned's team is using a static analysis tool from 2002 but technology uh hasn't hasn't been introduced from hasn't changed really since then there, there's there's been new stuff but Ned's team is still using these kind of tools. And uh, this is 2002 to 2003 timeframe. And, you know, we're in 2020. So that's, these are old tools that he's using. And what's, what's wrong with old security tools as long as they're getting updates, right? Well, they can be slower. Um, they can be slower both with scanning and remediation. Um, I know for a fact that one of the SAS tools I used at um, I used at a previous employer uh, when we needed to update the tool, we had to contact our IT because they owned the server uh, and we didn't have permissions to get the machine key. So they'd go and get a machine key um, for the server that it was running on. Then they would uh, provide us the machine key. We'd open a ticket with the SaaS provider. They'd create the new SaaS tool uh, keyed with our machine key so that we can utilize it. They'd give it back to us. Then we'd have to open a ticket with our IT support to install the new upgrade. That takes forever. And people were hesitant to jump on to upgrade these tools. Can you imagine how many vulnerabilities you might miss during that process? You're waiting on people. You're having to open tickets. Um, by the time this all happened, sometimes it took three weeks, uh, an update would come out and we would be updated three to four weeks later. And during that time frame, you can miss new vulnerabilities. I mean, just think about the last week. Uh, it, anybody see the um, show of uh, emojis on uh, on Discord, but anybody see the most recent like um, RCEs? There was a F5 one, a big IP one. Uh, there were several within the last week um, in some big corporate type tools. And if you're taking four weeks to upgrade your tools, you're going to miss stuff like that. And you're gonna miss vulnerabilities. Another problem with old old tooling is alert fatigue. Uh, tools were, got really good at telling you when something could be wrong. Uh, they got, they never, they never really learned 
um, basically how to tailor those alerts. So uh, oftentimes with SAS, you, you end up getting overwhelmed with alerts. Not to mention web application firewalls. Um, web application firewalls, uh, that's mostly just a regex search uh, against the inputs. And we're going to, uh, um, we're going to talk more about that, but that really causes alert fatigue as well. And they don't offer the best protection against attacks. Um, this is uh, like static code is essentially uh, attempting to read your code and determine if there's a vulnerability. Um, more on that later. We're gonna there's a little foreshadowing. So let's talk a little bit about mergers and acquisitions. Uh, again. I created these slides pre-COVID. This is an outdated practice now. But um, M&A is a, is a big part of big business. If you work for a big company, you can expect that there's gonna be a merger or acquisition while you're there. It's, a, it's natural, uh, especially if your company is publicly traded. Um, you know, there's the famous quote uh, by the Microsoft CEO, every business will be a software business. And um, you've heard probably Mark Andreessen say, uh, software is eating the world, right? Um, every company is having, have some, they, they all have some sort of software component to them now. And when you're acquiring another company, you don't know what you're inheriting. Uh, it could be terrible software, could be garbage servers, et cetera. Uh, and that's a major problem for internal application security teams. I worked at a company that did M&A and it didn't involve the application security team at all. And again, that was a big problem because what we ended up, what ended up happening was we would inherit something and we'd have to spend you know, uh, a full-time employee essentially fixing their code uh, because we just inherited somebody with uh, you know, 40 uh, critical vulnerabilities, including the most basic uh, uh, one e or one SQL injection. Like we inherited a company with a problem like that. And so there was there was a lot of um, heartache, a lot of grief. Uh, and this is, a, this is a major problem industry-wide. And when you think about application spread, um, large organizations, they already have more applications than the industry. And now they're doing M&A to just add to Ned's pile of ever-growing work. Here's, let me just, uh, let me just bring that in real quick here. Here's, here's the differences, right? Industry-wide. So that means um, organizations with uh, a single owner to organizations with um, thousands of employees, 5,000 plus employees. Look at the difference here. Uh, the, the numbers, down here uh, next to the color, those are the number of applications that your company has. Industry-wide, across the whole industry, more than half of companies have less than 200 applications. But when you are looking at a large organization with 5,000 plus employees, the majority of those, 36%, have over a thousand applications. I mean, you're talking about time tracking software, internal applications. You're talking about external facing websites, external facing software. Every one of these applications is included in this. Um, and that's a huge discrepancy, right? Uh, when you're looking solely at a large organization and the majority of those have over a thousand applications, that's a huge difference. And now they're adding more. Right through mergers and mergers and acquisitions, they're adding more company, more software, more applications. And, uh, and when you're acquiring another company, you're not adding just one or two applications. You're adding their entire software stack. Uh, you know you're exposed in the entire way that they're exposed. You know if they have a bad infrastructure, you're you know that you're inheriting that. We had, um, in my experience, we had uh, a, a spot where we were acquiring another company. It was a smaller organization, and they were able to pass PCI compliance through a self-check because they were small enough. 
when you're small enough, you can basically fill out a worksheet and they'll say that you're PCI compliant. And we went and looked and uh, they would have failed or they would have made us fail our, our PCI compliance. So we couldn't acquire them until after uh, we went through our PCI um, compliance uh, audit because uh, we would have failed. So we, we had to finish our audit before we acquired this company because just by acquiring them, we were going to fail our entire audit. And then, then we had to go and fix all of their stuff over the course of the next year. And that's a challenge. And that's a challenge for AppSecNed. Uh, let's talk. Let's talk about new products and new technologies. This is this is a popular topic because there's always something bigger and better and better and best out there. Um, I mean, let's face it, software change is constant, and I don't, uh, I don't mind that. I mean, that's that's a good thing. We want software change to happen. I mean, it's usually for the better, right? Just here, I, I show like you've got your agile. Um, you've got your DevOps, uh, you have your microservices, uh, you've got your cloud providers, uh, Azure, GCP, and AWS. You've got your uh, continuous integration platforms like freaking Jenkins, uh, GitLab, and GitHub Actions. Um, you have your containers, Kubernetes, Docker. I mean, these are these are all happening, you know, and things are just continually add to the software stack. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Like I said, these are great. I love Docker containers. I love the ability to create my own app that just spins up in, a, in its own container and I can just kill it um, whenever I need to. I like continuous integration platforms. These are, these are good things. But let's talk about the problem with that, right? Uh, so as, as Ned is noticing here, his mountain is starting to get a little bigger, you know. It started with the old tooling, the mergers and acquisitions, and now new technologies. Um, new products and new products and new technologies. I mean, what's the new hotness, right? Um, here's an example. Uh, Rust, Go, uh, Kotlin. Um, Ru <laughs> the funny thing about this Rust logo is uh, I don't play video games. And for the longest time in the slide deck, I had uh, I had the Rust video game logo until somebody somebody told me last week. <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. But um, these are all these are all new hot languages, right? I don't want to discourage innovation, but encourage consideration, right? Um, when you have these new technologies, chances are Ned's existing tools don't cover it yet, right? Um, in 2008, I think, is when Go came out, and Go is just starting to get uh, wide acceptance into tools nowadays. And it's been, it was invented in 2007. Okay, here's a note I have. It was invented in 2007, and it launched in 2009 as open source. So it's been around for 11 years, and tools are starting to just, like, have a wide acceptance of Go for example. So when a new language comes out like Rust or Kotlin, I mean, those two aren't very old. Uh, you know, how long will it be before we have tools that support that? It could be a while, right? So again, we're not discouraging innovation here, just encourage consideration. So we'll talk more about how we can handle that, but this is just adding to Ned's challenges, and these mountains are getting bigger and bigger. And um, Ned was aware of some of the industry-wide challenges, but these challenges at these big companies um, where it's the wild, wild west and developers have the uh, latitude and to just do what they want, right? Um, is just adding to is just adding to his um, his stack. Let's talk a little bit about workplace shifts. Workplace shifts happen especially with time. It's hard to ignore the facts, but there are several kinds of workplace shifts or relocations. Um, you know, older developers retire or move into new roles. Layoffs, I mean, layoffs are a big thing nowadays too. There's a, when I'm on Twitter, there's a lot of people who are looking for work. Um, 
and that's that's tough, right? Uh, sometimes layoffs are even accompanied by overseas hiring, so that that's why I didn't call this just uh, just um, workplace loss, but I called it workplace shift because uh, sometimes you have people going out, uh, sometimes you have people being replaced, and and that kind of thing happens. It's it's natural, um, you know. It's a it's a crappy thing to talk about, but um, it's 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 natural and it's even more natural at large corporations. Uh, this is this is to be expected. And um, you know, Ned has Ned has a problem with workplace shift, right? Uh, Ned has to train new employees uh, sometimes in remote locations, uh, whether it be a time zone difference or a language barrier. It's tough to work with new employees directly. And how do they retain the knowledge of the departing staff? How do we continue to meet application security standards when we have turnover in our own staff? Um, these are challenges that Ned faces with workplace shifts. Um, what about application security secrets? You know, when you have uh, when you have people getting laid off, how does Ned um, Ned has to concern himself with application security secrets? Um, you know, if, if we lay somebody off, Ned also has to worry about, you know, a disgruntled employee. So these are these are things that, you know, Ned has uh, to keep in the back of his head. And, and those mountains are looking big and he's looking nervous now. Lastly, uh, this is a topic everyone loves to hate, but inflexible developers. Um, I was a developer. I was a developer for almost nine years. So. I have a, a lot of experience with development teams um, and application security teams. So what is an inflexible developer? Well, um, here's an example. Uh, inflexible developers see security as a blocker, right? And, uh, and that's a problem. Uh, security and tech debt will grow. Sometimes engineering fights to backlog security. And sometimes findings are swept under the rug, right? If you give, there's only so much latitude you can give your developers. If you give them enough permissions to um, to ignore a finding or to claim that a finding is not an issue, um, is that is that too much latitude? Are they going to just say that all things are not issues, right? So this is a this is a challenge, and uh, there's a lot to consider here. And that mountain is starting to look really big for AppSecNed. He's starting to get a little nervous. It seems impossible, but um, we're going to talk about how to summit, right? And and what we can do and how we can climb that mountain. Uh, Ned is uh, currently he's he's still at Basecamp, so he's having fun, um, like Mitch Hadberg says. Uh, Basecamp is fun. But Ned has to climb the mountain. So just starting out, he has a lot of energy to tackle some of these big things. Uh, again, Ned's directives, um, he wanted to ensure that all code bases are secure, uh, including all open source software. Uh, he wanted to ensure that all future development is secure. And uh, again, his board wants him to shift left with future development. Uh, he has to train software developers and secure coding practices, and minimize attack vectors in external facing applications. These are all um, Ned's directives passed down from the board. Uh, he, you know, he has his, his uh, industry challenges, but then he also has to worry about the challenges we've discussed building up this mountain, uh, basically that come along with being a big organization. So let's talk about shifting left. If you haven't heard this term, um, basically shifting left is the idea that you involve security earlier on in the uh, SD, um, the software development lifecycle, right? SDLC. So the idea being that uh, the earlier you involve your security team in this uh, entire process, the better, right? And so here's here's kind of a, just. Uh, talking about Ned's environment and, and a lot of corporate environments, here's kind of a typical setup, 
right? Your software security scanning tools sit between test and acceptance, um, you know, pre-production. And you're scanning and you're, you know, you're cycling back from here, uh, back earlier on to the code phase, and you're going back and forth here. Uh, you have stuff out in production. Um, if you have a web application firewall, I have yet to work for a company that had a web application firewall in block mode, just sitting there in block mode, because uh, it was blocking too many legitimate requests. Most companies um, have a WAF in a monitor mode, and that is where it takes in logs and it's logging all the traffic essentially, and then you have something on the back end tracking what a WAF says is an issue and determining whether it is or not. You have a person or you've written a program to parse these logs, um, but a lot of WAFs are sitting there in monitor mode. So this is a typical environment setup right here. <clears throat> and let's, real quick, again, the challenges are old tooling, mergers and acquisitions, new products, new technologies, workplace shifts, and inflexible developers. So let's let's talk about tooling, right? How can Ned climb that part of the mountain here? Uh, can newer security tooling really help with speed? Uh, the answer is a resounding yes. So I'm going to introduce you to two concepts here, and may, maybe you've heard of them. But um, IAST and RASP are two of the newer security technologies. Uh, IAST is an interactive application security testing, and RASP is a runtime application self-protection. Basically, uh, you allow agents to instrument the code bases to both provide security against attacks and allow for more expedient remediation by pinpointing issues. Now, let me talk more in detail about that, right? Um, with an IS solution, you can detect vulnerabilities with instrumentation uh, to observe applications as they run during testing. Uh, you can assess the security of code, user interaction, user interaction, libraries, frameworks, backend connections, and configurations, and essentially perform continuous and real-time uh, application security testing uh, throughout the entire life cycle. This means that developers get immediate feedback. And some IS solutions have route intelligence, basically completely mapping each route in the application. When you think about pen testing, right? There's the old, uh, there's the old routing um, when you're when you're routing a web application backwards, right? We are thinking, okay, what are my avenues of attack, and how can I attack this application? Um, and I, an IAS solution routes it forwards, so it routes the entire thing from you know from initialization all the way to all the different possibilities of of where inputs you know occur and um, what code touches what code, and that kind of thing. Uh, can really help <clears throat> when pinpointing issues. Uh, and RASP is another popular modern um, application security tooling. Uh, RASP can detect and block exploitation of software vulnerabilities. Uh, basically, it can differentiate between attack attempts or probes um, that can impact an application, uh, unlike a perimeter-based web application firewall. Uh, let me give you an example of that. Here's an example, right? Uh, you have two different inputs. One is a your most common SQL injection attack, and one is your most common cross site scripting attack. Uh, if this is your code where you're essentially uh, setting a name, right? Uh, obviously, if you're familiar with um, with JavaScript, uh, this is going to result in a cross-site scripting alert. It won't result in a SQL injection. You're not touching SQL. So in this case, RASP actually instruments the code. Uh, it sees this input. It allows the input to go through. But once it gets uh, posted here back to the page, that's considered a sync. So it watches source to sync. And if something if an input tries to escape a sync boundary it will flag on it so in this case um, a WAF might block both of these because they both look egregious but if you are um, if you are naming your team 
after little bobby tables or just having fun with an or one equals one uh in this case um it would be fine right i mean you have no problem taking this information and sticking it in as a name uh so uh rasp would watch this input and it would not escape the sync boundary and of course it would just paste it into the name meanwhile uh input number two here uh, that's a problem and brass would flag on it so that's why it can differentiate between attack attempts and attacks that have actual impact right um it can also protect application runtime environments from unwanted changes and tampering uh and again we're tracing attack attempts from source to sync uh so here's here's kind of some stats to back this up right this is a um this is from contrast and Veracode uh the um, percent of vulnerabilities closed within one month of discovery um nearly 60 percent almost double of the of vulnerabilities found with rasp tools are closed versus a sas tool and you might say why is that well it, the reason is because rasp can more accurately tell you um exactly what the problem is and you have data to actually uh track source to sync uh, and then also, you close more vulnerabilities with RASP faster. I mean, that's essentially what we're saying here. Uh, RASP um, has only 32% remaining after that three months of discovery. Remember at the beginning, I said industry-wide, the average remediation time is 171 days. So after three months, you know, if you only have 30% left of your vulnerabilities, you've closed 70%, you're shortening that time, that window, which is great. Uh, meanwhile, SAS still has over half their vulnerabilities have yet to be remediated after three months. So as you can see, definitely um, using modern technology and modern tooling uh, can definitely have a big impact on your vulnerability remediation. So I'd like to propose maybe shifting out, right? Uh, where you're shifting left still, but you're also shifting right, uh, where you're moving some of your tooling into production, like RASP. Uh, you can also, with with something like RASP, it's easier to uh, tune your WAF into block mode, right? You can um, you can remove a lot of the, you can uh, use a simpler rule set, a more egregious rule set, and turn it on into block mode. And then RASP, you know, is also there to uh, protect against stuff that isn't in your WAF rule set. And you can shift left and involve IAS in development, right? Um, IAS is gonna provide feedback to developers while they're working in their IDEs and testing, uh, testing and routing their own code. So as they're testing a new feature, you know, you could get IAS feedback already. So now you're, now you're involving security super early on in the in the design phase but also in production right so you you're shifting out um each way and you're there's um uh this can only benefit you so ned feels pretty good about that and he's made his he's made some progress ned thinks that he has a good idea of where to go with old tooling um but he he still has a long way to go right he's this is i think mordor uh, from Lord of the Rings, and they they got you know they get on top of one little mountain, but they still have a long way to go. So let's talk a little bit about mergers and acquisitions. Uh, in and in my mind, this is the most obvious solution, but the hardest solution, um, because you're essentially having to convince your executive level staff that you need to get AppSec more involved in AMA discovery. Uh, earlier, you, you heard me tell an anecdote about how uh, I worked for a company where we acquired a, um, a company and didn't, uh, didn't even get to check them out until after we acquired them and had their software in-house. Uh, it can only be positive if AppSec is more involved during the discovery phase. Let's think about this, right? Uh, if Ned discovers that something is amiss, I mean, theoretically, you can use that as a negotiation tactic. 
your C-suite uh, and your negotiators can lower total pricing if they say, hey, we're going to have to fix a bunch of your security issues. This is a problem. Um, also, it's going to give Ned the leverage to demand more headcount. If you think about it, and if Ned's team is able to identify security issues and it's able to potentially um, lower total cost, uh, then you um, you have the ability to uh, save the company money and and also tell them this is going to require more work, so I need more people. So, and if Ned if Ned discovers uh, uh, nothing egregious, then he can begin planning on onboarding. I mean, that you know that'll at least give them a little edge on onboarding. So uh, overall. You know this can only be positive because involving involving uh, AppSec is either going to save you money or give Ned a jump start. But you do have to convince the C-suite, which is uh, again that's what I found to be one of the bigger challenges. But Ned Ned feels like hey you know it, it, if I'm he's able to talk to his C-suite and uh, convince them using the the old adage that money talks um you know and and we're going to either save money or save time uh by involving my team so ned is not quite at the midway point but he's making some serious progress now so let's talk about new products and new technologies how can ned contain this ever growing landscape of products for developers it's sprawling right and it's not going to go well if you tell developers that you're taking away their ability to innovate, right? You can't you can't say to a development team like I'm taking away all of your administrative privileges because you you want to write something using Rust. That, that's terrible. That, that like that's that'll weigh in later during this uh, development appsec relationship. You know, uh, again, I want to hammer this point home. We don't want to discourage innovation, we want to encourage consideration. So how can the AppSec team work with the development teams uh, and, and their managers uh, in order to basically um, basically create an acceptable, it, well, to create an acceptable use policy here. So uh, Ned is going to, he's going to create this policy and it's, and, uh, Adding to it is easy, but it needs to be reviewed by an enterprise architecture review board or an ERB. Um, so essentially Ned's gonna go through and he's gonna whitelist a bunch of technologies that you can use. And if you wanna add a new technology, uh, you just propose it to this ERB board, right? And uh, the ERB board, um, basically their mission is to provide a strategic approach to innovate technology-based solutions by maintaining an optimal, consistent set of standardized best practices. Uh, so essentially, they wanna review the new technology that you're bringing in, determine if we have a solution where we can cover its security, support its, the, you know, support its use, and, uh, and they wanna be able to accelerate the time to market on the product. So this is something that's enforceable then by compliance. Ned's gonna take advantage of that compliance team that I mentioned uh, in the beginning, as one of his uh, as one of his um, climbing tools, so the compliance will enforce this um, this list. Uh, but adding to it is easy enough. So uh, we want to again allow developers to innovate, um, but we want to make sure that they're aware that you know their innovation is going to affect the company in some way, and so we need a team to review that. If we check in on Ned, he has now uh, he has now uh, conquered three out of the five challenges. Uh, let's talk real quickly about the workplace shift or the departed. Um, this happens. It's not always fun and not always with much notice. Uh, if Ned doesn't have advanced warning of relocation or layoff, there's a few things that he can prepare ahead of time. Uh, you may or may not have heard of burn lists. Uh, basically, uh, it's a list of user accounts and where they exist. Um, this can be vast and take a significant amount of time, but the sooner Ned can automate it, the better. So uh, you'll want to make sure that you are aware of all of the user accounts that you're going to have to take, you're going to have to remove. 
the security operations are going to remove their you know their uh, Microsoft Outlook access, their VPN access, but you want to make sure to also make sure to also remove any application credentials uh, that they have. Also, um, this is an interesting one that not many people do. I found a default credential sweep. Uh, I worked at a company in the early 2000s that has a default credential in their production environment still. It's, it's a credential that developers use to develop uh, and uh, it's still out there. So NED creates a default cred sweep, basically ensuring that any testing credentials don't make it up into production. So uh, workplace shift. Um, that, so what about new employees, right? I mean, that, that's how to handle the parted and try to, you know, retain that um, knowledge and, and worry about, you know, a disgruntled employee. But uh, what about new employees? Well, NED has to use a training platform that works remotely and is easy to distribute. Uh, it's important that any new employee go through secure software development training before they touch code, uh, so he makes it a part of uh, the onboarding process. Uh, NED also creates documentation around standard best coding practices. Uh, this is something that um, kind of revolutionized uh, a, a company that I was working at, where um, his team stubbed out authentication, session management, API requests, database connections, and, and more. Like you just wrote code snippets that worked for this language that you knew was secure and is in common use. So that team, like let's say it's .NET, right? You write out a .NET um, uh, authentication uh, and a .NET session management stub, and your .NET team, if they're onboarding someone and they say like, hey, you need to add authentication, just go over here and check out that stub that's already ready to go you can just go grab it so uh again i'm doing checking on ned ned's doing great he's near the top of the mountain he's uh high enough to appreciate the view but not comfortable yet uh this is the big one right inflexible developers um application fighting engineering is a fight where everybody loses if you remember uh the old movie war games uh the only way to win the game is not to play so uh there are several things that can improve the relationship first off application security should be housed outside the engineering group either under a CISO, cio or cfo you need to create a separation of priorities among engineering management engineering should not be able to say no to something that you deem a critical security fix it's also important to reiterate that application security is a resource, not a hindrance. It's not a blocker. After all, your developers don't want to push vulnerable code. Uh, application security engineers should have development experience, in my opinion. Uh, this this set the Twitter world aflame when somebody tweeted this. Uh, this like last year, but uh, they think that you know application security developers in particular should have development experience. Um, or extensive experience with code. I think the best way to become an application security developer is to be a developer first, and then you know gain the security experience um, and move into security and application security. So uh, why is that important? Well, think about how you can endear yourself to developers, right? You, you it should be a partnership between the AppSec team and the development team, um, and Think about ways you can, you know, endear yourself. Um, training can be fun. You could gamify competitions. I've hosted CTF competitions uh, for uh, my development teams. Uh, it can help bond each other. Uh, it can help the dev team, you know, learn and um, that you are an expert in your field. Uh, you could do secure coding hackathons, lunch and learn sessions, Q and A sessions, uh, provide lunch once a month. Uh, joint outings include development and team outings. I mean, this is this is crucial, right? It's a partnership, right? It you should if you're an application team member and you work with you know lots of developers in the same office post COVID, let's say, uh, you should be having lunch with them. You should be seeing them on a regular basis, making friends with them because working with uh, working with people um, like that is going to make your relationship uh, less combative. And more of a partnership, right? Uh, Ned happens to buy his uh, 
he buys pizza once a month. So Ned's over there eating pizza. So if you look at uh, Ned, he's, 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 um, I think he's accomplished all his, his directives, right? He's ensured that all current code bases are secure, including open source software. Uh, he's uh, ensured future development is secure. He's shifted out with future development. Uh, he's trained software developers in secure coding practices and uh, minimized attack vectors and external facing applications. So at this point, Ned, I'm gonna call it, Ned's, Ned's summited the mountain. Um, I wrapped it up about 53. So I have about seven minutes for questions and comments. Please drop them in uh, in Discord and I'll answer them. A German poster of the new guy. Uh, believe it or not, I couldn't find a good uh, suited suitable for work poster uh, from America. So yeah, is a German one. Uh, let's see. Open question: What's the best RASP tool? Do you think is out there? In your honest opinion. Also, same with the IAS tools. Uh, well, Brian and Wobblebox, um, I work for a company that provides both IS and RASP, and I work on the team that helps drive the um, innovation and product. So I don't think that's a very fair question because uh, I'm going to I'm going to answer it one way, and I don't want this to turn into a uh, a product supported talk. So um, I I know that uh, RASP and IS tools there are several out there. Um, I know that if you are looking at an IS tool, I would encourage one that does complete route intelligence uh, because I think that that's going to provide the best coverage. Uh, when you're looking at RASP tools, um, I think that configuration is important. Uh, and I think that configuration is important. And, um, and so I think that's something that allows you to kind of uh, tune your own rule sets is uh, is important because um, your unique in business environment or your unique business unit uh, is going to have different rules than you know somebody else's business unit. So you're going to need to be able to say like this is important to me or that I want to put this into monitor mode or block mode kind of thing. Um, I think that you're going to want something that's uh, continually innovating uh, uh, and has um, future focused mindsets. So. Uh, I know that my company does that, um, but I'm not going to, uh, you know, compare with other other companies. So. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I said something. Uh, I said someone's username. I don't know if that was wrong. Oh, let's see here. Any other questions? Yoga might help if you're an inflexible developer. Uh, thanks, uh, Panda. I was wondering why they keep telling the AppSec team down dog. I don't know if I follow that mark. Uh, feel free to clarify. So, uh, any other questions? Um, please drop them in uh, in Discord. I've got a few minutes left here. Okay, well, uh, I haven't seen any any future questions. I'm gonna move to the breakout room. Uh, I know that um, the next person probably wants to prepare. So uh, thanks so much, I really appreciate it. Uh, again, thank you to the organizers of uh, Besides San Antonio. I really wish I could, I could have visited San Antonio for the first time, but um, maybe next year, so thank you. <laughs>